It's good to be with you today. If you are visiting Connorsville for the first time, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, please stop by our Welcome Center following the service. Grab a coffee mug to remember your time here. Um, if you're joining us online today, we're glad that you're with us as well. And today, uh, we just want to come and no matter uh, where our minds have been, where our hearts have been this week, we, we come to God's house to remember uh, the promises that he's made to us, the promises that we've made to him. Uh, he put us on earth for a purpose. That purpose is to represent him to the world. It is to love other people as he has loved us. It is to, <coughs> to nurture and to protect his creation and to make life flourish. And that is a huge calling. And today as we um, come into worship, uh, we're going to stand together right now and we're going to commit ourselves to the Lord and ask for his um, presence in a mighty way with us today. Lord God, we come to you today. Some of us feel very far from you. Others feel close. But no matter where we are, we could always be closer to you. And so, Lord, we ask, because of your promise, that you will lead us to the rock that is higher than us. And that rock is the temple, Jesus Christ, the place where heaven and earth meet, the place where we can come and find our refuge and our strength. And that place is a person, and that person is Jesus, our Messiah. Lord, now we acknowledge that he has been glorified, and he sits at your right hand, and he is our king forever and ever. And Lord, because of that, because he stands for us, and he has brought us into your family through his shed blood, we can come to you today. Lord, because of his promise, help us to keep our promises to you, that we will be faithful, that we will stand up and witness for you, that we will live our lives in a manner that is worthy of, of the salvation that you've given to us. And Lord, today as we come, May all of our thoughts and actions be pleasing to you, and the words that we say glorify you in your most precious name, and all God's people said, amen. We're going to begin with, uh, in Isaiah 6, it just talks about, like Isaiah, Isaiah was in God's temple just minding his own business, doing his routine, and all of a sudden, uh, he just looked up, and God's robe was coming out. And there were angels, and it was mind-blowing. Imagine if we had an experience like that today. Uh, but all the angels in heaven were just seeing how holy God was. And he is holy. He is high above everything that we can think or imagine. And this is just a declaration that we acknowledge that God is holy. We are not. Um, and he is worthy of our praise. So just join us as we sing holy, holy, holy.
he has promised that he will do just what he said. Do you believe what he has promised to you today? As we sing this song, let's just um, think about his promises, his goodness. He has promised to never leave us, forsake us, and he sealed the deal with his own blood. You can't get any better than that. Amen.
where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. celebrated the independence of our nation. We were under the control of a country that only wanted all that they could get from us. People grew tired of the oppression, so in 1776, the United States declared independence from England and put together a document stating so. That would have been all fine and good if everyone just accepted that document but England didn't roll over and play dead. They decided to stop this revolution dead in its tracks. So began the war. After many years and lots and lots of casualties, the war ended. 
The United States had won their independence. It was official. But the independence only came with a lot of bloodshed. Many people gave their life so that others could have the freedom to live as they chose. Now today, as Christians, we are in church worshiping God. We know that mankind was made in the image of God and given the perfect place to live, the Garden of Eden. But that wasn't good enough for us. Mankind did the one thing that God told them not to do. That was to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They took a bite. Eve took the fruit, took a bite of the fruit, and gave some to Adam. Thus, sin entered the world of mankind. They were banished from the garden, and God no longer walked and talked with them daily. I'm going to insert a little situation here that's kind of my imagination. You won't find this in the Bible anymore. So all the bad things that come on to Adam and Eve, like Adam being out in the field, working, toiling, chopping out weeds, sweating, anything he had to do to try to provide food for he and his wife. Eve, on the other hand, was back at home taking care of the house. She had dirt floors in the house. She had to keep them all clean. And, here, and she had pain in childbirth during when she had her children. So all things pertaining to sin had come upon them then, and they were dealing with that. So my situation here is Adam has been out in the field working one day, and he comes in, and he's basically just beat, totally beat down. The sun was really hot that day, kind of like it's been this past week or two. And he's out there with a hoe, not like the hoe we had, but he just had a stick with something on the end of it trying to get the weeds out of his crop so he could have something to eat. So he comes in, he's worn out, he's dirty, he's tired, and he goes in and he sits down at the table there where Eve had prepared supper. And Eve is not in much better shape. She'd been laboring all day, and she was just about worn out too. She didn't look much better than he did. She was dirty. She was ragged, just dealing with everything they had to deal with. So they sit down and they eat. And Adam looks over at Eve, and he sees her sitting there. And he says, Eve, why did we have to eat that fruit? Well, now that the deed was done, sin had entered their lives. There was absolutely nothing that they could do or to give to make it go away. Sin made man imperfect. The animal sacrifices that were supposed to be offered had to be as perfect as possible. They couldn't have blemishes on them. But even that only rolled sin back for a time. There had to be a way, and only God could provide the way. God sent his son, the only perfect son of God to earth, to be the perfect sacrifice to conquer sin for once and all, once and for all. That didn't mean just coming to earth and living a perfect life. It meant there had to be bloodshed in order to cover sin once and forever. Jesus was, lived his life. He was falsely accused. He was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death on the cross. In Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 44, it says, And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, 
this was a righteous man. Jesus died like a man on the cross, but he arose from the dead. He defeated death, which is the penalty for sin. He walked the earth once again before he ascended to back to his Father in heaven. Today, as we gather around the table, may we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, but also let us be thankful for the freedom from sin, sin's consequences that he has given us. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we are truly thankful for this time that we can come in together in your house and worship together. Father, for this time that we can pause in this service and gather around your table that you have made for us. Father, as we gather around this table, I just pray that we might truly remember the suffering that Jesus did on that cross, the pain and the anguish that he took there for us. And may we realize that Jesus did this because there was nothing that we ourselves could do to rid ourselves of sin. As we partake of this loaf and this cup, may we remember that Jesus gave his body and his blood on that cross for us. And because he gave his body and his blood, Father, we have the freedom from the consequences of sin that we no longer have to fear. Father, be with us now as we continue this service, and most of all, forgive us for we do sin. This I ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here today. And uh, today you're in for a treat. We have a guest speaker. And uh, I'd like to introduce to you Schubert Remy. And uh, he is the founder and director of Haiti Christian Mission. And uh, he has been here at the church for what, since uh, uh, the 1980s, right? <laughs> so. Uh, you can do the math in your head. I'm not going to try uh, right now, but um, he's been with this church a long time, and uh, so we're grateful to have him here And uh, as he tells us what's been going on in his life. So, Schubert, please give a, a warm welcome. I am so happy to be back here. I can hear myself. Good. I'm happy to be back to share with you. God has been good. And when I say God has been good, he has been good. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. But it is just startles me to see what God is doing. It fascinates me to stand and observe what's going on around the world, around America. And as Warren said, I've been coming here since uh, 1984. If you remember, those of you old enough to remember, uh, I came here in 84 with John Sutphin that summer. He was just minister here, and uh, we've been connected since. But I must tell you that the America I was introduced to in the mid-80s is not the America I'm looking at right now. And you, can, you know the story probably better than I do. You can understand why the change has happened. You understand what has happened in the world, what's happening in our communities, which should speak to, your, to the urgency, let me say better, 
the urgency of uh, we Christians and the church stepping up our efforts to proclaim Christ around the world and particularly this country, America. When I came here in 1984, America, in my view, was God's chosen country because I was raised by American missionaries who taught me that uh, God loves America and America loves the world and America is a Christian country. It's a country where God is blessing and you can see the blessing because every single person dreams about coming to America. That America has changed. And uh, allow me to say that this America has changed because we Christians have taken it for granted and we have not opened our mouths to speak as loudly as we should have. We have allowed the uh, microphone to be taken away by the wrong voices. Now, I'm not going to say how to do that, but I remember that Christ gave us a work to do, and he told us to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all people. Go proclaim the gospel. And I believe that if we do proclaim the gospel, we don't have to necessarily fight against anyone or any ideology. We should only remain on the positive message of proclaiming that Jesus, the Son of God, came into this earth because his Father loved us so much that he wanted, us to, restore, he wanted to restore the initial relationship that we had in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve ate that fruit and sinned. That relationship is what God is urging us to come back to from time immemorial. And I must also tell you that God has the power right now to make you love him, follow him, and do whatever he says. But that same loving God respects you enough because when he created you and me, he said, let us make men according to our image, according to our resemblance. The image of God is that he is a creative God. The image of God, he is a God who expresses his will, who loves because it's within himself to love. And he wants you to exercise that very same quality, to choose to follow him because you choose to do so. You follow God because you love God. You follow God because you understand that he loves you. You follow God not because he forced you to do so, but because you choose to do so. Therefore, he gave Adam and Eve the choice. Do not eat the fruit of the tree. When you, if you do, you'll die. He tells us to come unto me, you who are weary and tired, and I will give you rest. Come. He says, I stand in the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. You see, in every single one of those instances, God extends an offer that we have the ability to either accept or reject. In our world today, we have chosen to go the other way. We have chosen to be uh, timid. We have chosen to be quiet. We have chosen to, uh, to pick what is most attractive. And the devil does not ne neglect to dangle in front of us this little shiny, beautiful, gold-like thing that is really not so. Happiness, which is not happiness. Riches, which leads nowhere. And all the fun things in life that don't really do anything to help anybody. So this morning, 
I come this to share with you about Haiti Christian Mission. I come to share with you about the ministry that is going on in Haiti. I come to share also with you as a people of God, as partners in the work that we do in Haiti, that uh, God has a purpose in everything he does. And I want to share with you some examples of how God has served that purpose in my life, which I didn't understand at first. It kind of frustrated me in the beginning until eventually things just came into focus and I understood what happened. Let me start with that and then I'll go to Haiti Christian Mission. I'll tell you about me a little bit. Okay? From a very young age, I've told you that story before, from when I was 15 years old, I dedicated my life to God and I asked God to take my life and use it. And he's responded to that. He's accepted my offer. He took my life. He's been using me since I was 15, 16. In my home, caring for my uh, siblings. After that, I went to, to church. I, used, I was, became youth leader. I cared for the youth. And then he, I was promoted to becoming an elder and a deacon at church. I became a deacon. And then a school principal. I still cared for people, preaching the gospel, teaching people. And I discovered this message that we're preaching today, the New Testament message. I was in the church of God doing all that time. But God accepted my prayer. He was guiding me into where I needed to be. I discovered this because I told you before, and I will repeat this so you can understand where I'm coming from, because I was about 19 years old, and I decided it is time to take a step that is serious. I want to dedicate my life to God and actually do it publicly. So I went and asked my pastor to be baptized, and he asked me to, uh, as you know, the Protestants do, you go and, uh, to baptismal class for six months in my case, and then after six months, I go through a test, I answer ten questions, if I answer them properly, I have maximum note, I can be uh, I, I admitted to the uh, a candidates for baptism on Sunday, and then on Friday night, the congregation must vote whether I'm good enough to be a member of the church and be baptized on Sunday morning. Okay, I got the response, and I reacted to it. I said, Pastor, who's been my teacher my whole life, since I was in second grade, he taught me. So I told him, I don't see that in Scripture. And I've been reading Acts, I don't see that in Scripture. So what I'm, I'm trying to tell you this so you can understand that the world does things that happen around us, but we keep quiet as a result we fall into situations that we can't get ourselves out of, like where we are right now in our world today, where the church stands right now. So it became a back and forth between he and I until finally I gave in. I waited six months. I was baptized after six months, and then I quit church. I quit church because I was convinced that what the path that he gave me was wrong. It was anti-scriptural. So I told him I chose my Bible and I will go with my Bible. I had nowhere to go. I had no one to call. I had no church to go. That's all I knew. So uh, I stopped going to church for a while and I was reading my Bible until I met an elderly lady who confirmed what I had found. Now, I'm telling you this because my story is a little bit different than uh, I would say most people because, you know, I've been steadily doing this and I've been a search, I continue searching, and I have not accepted to settle with any institution because I know that the truth of God's Word is in here, and I also believe, and I've been, it's been I've had confirmation of that, that the Holy Spirit who inspired these words is still alive, He's still working within his church, within his people. He's still guiding the difficulties that we're not willing to listen. We are allowing ourselves to be blinded by uh, the theologies and by the ideologies of the world, and we are not following Christ. This morning, I want to take an example of Paul to show you that. Paul in Acts chapter 21 finds himself a difficulty. Difficulty because he's preaching the gospel, he has oppositions, and he's going back to Jerusalem. His last time that he knows. Okay. And uh, it is difficult 
no one was awaiting him in Jerusalem. He, uh, he insisted stubbornly, but he makes a, 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 a claim in verses 13 and 14 of uh, Acts 21 that really, I didn't catch on to that until later, but the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul said that he will go, and I'm paraphrasing, he will go to Jerusalem. Whatever happens, happens because he gives no value to his life but to do what God wants. As I have dedicated my life to God, not comparing myself to the Apostle Paul by no means, but what I'm saying is that when a Christian is dedicated to following God, God serves with circumstances to guide your life in ways that you don't understand. And I'll, the latest thing that happened to me, I want to share that with you. And then I'll tell you about the work in Haiti. I have a tumor in my brain. Had no idea. Been going back and forth to Haiti. I've had symptoms. I have no idea what they are. I had to explain them. I had difficulty. And uh, I came here last September. And my plans were to go back to Haiti the f in October. I couldn't. Haiti, basically, sociopolitically caught on fire. Guns on the street like a war zone. My neighborhood is invaded by gangs, and the streets there are just armed guy, guys walking with the machine guns and shooting everywhere. I can't go back to Haiti. I said, okay, this October is not possible. Let's wait for Christmas. Give them a few, time, a few months. Nothing ameliorates. January, nothing. February, nothing. Uh, March, nothing. And then I fell. Walked out of my house to help a neighbor. And then I fell unconscious on the, on the, in the snow, in the ice. Didn't sleep, I just fell. And my daughters reminded me that that's the third time you fell, you've fallen. Unconscious. I decided to figure out what it was. Come to find out, two more in the back of my head, uh, blocking the circulation in my brain. Okay, and I found out that our brain uh, generates about two liters of fluid per day. Mine is clogged, so no circulation. Fluid is building right here, putting pressure on the, my two hemispheres of my brain, and then uh, causing symptoms. And I said, well, I need to find out what's going on. So we went to the doctor, several doctors, and one doctor sent us to another until finally we got to a surgeon at UC that uh, determined that we have to, and surgery has to be done quickly. Now, that's not the most important part. Let's see God's hands in all of that. I'm focused on working in Haiti. I'm focused on going back and forth. Circumstances happen, I don't know why they're happening. And God found a way to block my going back to Haiti. I remember Paul said the same thing as he was going on to Macedonia to preach, and the God's Spirit refrained him from going there. For what reason, we don't know. He did not explain. But God stops him. Sometimes in our lives, things happen that we don't know. We push against God, push against God so that we can have our will while we're not listening to what God is trying to tell us. Rushing back to the States in September, when I had gone back, I could have been caught in Haiti and not be able to get out. In fact, in March, I got out of Haiti on the very last flight out of Haiti before things, you know, the, the airport shut down. September, I went back to Haiti. I came back here. October to go back. I cannot go back to Haiti, and I keep wondering why. I'm just knocking my head to find ways to go there to Haiti, but I cannot go into Haiti. I couldn't go in February. Couldn't go in March, couldn't go in April, could not go in May, and I find myself on May 24th in a hospital with brain surgery. No doctors in Haiti. The streets are unsafe. I could not have gone to the hospital. I'm in the country where I am. There is no very little cell signal, no doctors, no hospitals, no nothing, and I could have gotten caught up there with no help. So today you would have 
I heard about my passing and my funeral. But God has a purpose for our lives. He's not done with me yet. And he's not done using me yet. Therefore, there's much more to do. I'm excited. See, the apostle, in the apostle Paul's case, he went to Jerusalem, chapter 21. Accused, went to court, exported to uh, Rome for judgment. He never went back to Jerusalem after that trip. But the point is that God uses circumstances sometimes to, uh, to further his kingdom. Your life is not yours. My life is not mine. Since we dedicated our lives to God, when we accepted his calling in Christian baptism, when we went under the water, we told him in that act, in that moment, that, Lord, my life is no more my own. I give it to you. And Paul says in Romans chapter, three, chapter 6, verse 3, 4, that at that moment, we die with Christ in the water. Our self dies, we're buried with him. And then we rise with him to walk in newness of life. Therefore, God decides when we move, we must be keen to listen. No comparison to me at all, but Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, facing tomorrow, Friday, prayed, agonized in prayer that night, felt the burden, the weight of Calvary the next day of the suffering. He said, God, please, Father, if it be your will, let this cup be taken away from me. But being in con contact with God, he caught himself. Nevertheless, not my will, let your will be done. And God's will was that he be, that he, he died a gruesome death on a cross. As Christians, I think if we are servants of God and He's leading us, we should open ourselves to understanding God and to following Him. The world, in our world today, we are clabbered with. Uh, uh, information, distractions that take all, all our attention away. We have a difficult time hearing, listening, because we're not quiet enough. Our world is not quiet. It's very loud. Loud with the cell phone, every five seconds, a beep, a message, a text, you know, something that catches our attention. We don't take time to be quiet, and it's difficult to do. Sometimes God is calling us to that time of quiet and peace where we can listen to him, how we can distance ourselves from our world to listen. So as I was going to say, I was saying that God has used circumstances in my life to preserve my life so that I can continue serving him. I'm not fully recovered. It's about a month and a half I guess uh, since the doctor gave me the, free, the freedom to move, you know, I'm still uh, quite fatigued when I do stuff. And I'm very active, naturally active person, very high metabolism, so I'm always going. And uh, it is difficult for me to know when to rein myself in. And uh, I get really annoyed, impatient. Impatient. I was to go to Haiti last month, again after surgery, about a month or so about after surgery. The doctor said I was okay. I felt okay. I felt wonderful until I started mowing my lawn one day. I went out to mow my lawn. I was probably a few yards into mowing the lawn, and I couldn't take another step. My legs were shaking. I was tired, and I, my daughter had to come and give me a hand. Then I realized, you are not really well. You need to calm down. Everyone's telling me that. So uh, I've learned my lesson. I've slowed down, and I'm doing stuff. I know that God is using this circumstance to help me, you know, to simmer down, listen, 
pay attention, you know. Maybe redirect me, I don't know. But I'm asking you to keep me in continued prayer so that I can hear what God is actually telling me. Okay, we, we can be so anxious about working for God that we put ourselves at odds with God's will by wanting to do His will so badly. We want to go left. God is saying, no, I want you to go the other direction. But that's where they need me. No, that's where I need you. And we have to listen. The Apostle Paul made the decision so far. We don't know whether going to Jerusalem then was God's will for him or not. We know the end of what happened. Uh, we know that God used him even through that, but I don't know. Maybe Paul's uh, ministry could have continued a couple, three, four, five, ten more years had he listened to uh, the people, to the prophets there, telling him, don't go to Jerusalem because you'll be arrested, and he didn't listen. So today we don't listen. Haiti Christian Mission is uh, continuing to work in Haiti. Here's the situation in Haiti right now. I can't, it would be unfair to compare Haiti to Ukraine, but I can easily compare Haiti to uh, South South Chicago, if you know the story of South South Chicago. We gang violence, we're shooting all the time. If you can imagine, you know, five, 10, 15 guys walking through, the, through your street with uh, automatic weapons on AK 47s and, and stuff with the weapons that not even our police carry, and the guys walking around with those shooting in the community, not at people directly, but really scaring the community and shooting at each other. That's the situation in my home neighborhood, the street right in front of my house in the church. I was preaching in Haiti the, about uh, a month ago. I was uh, preaching and uh, I was online preaching. And as I was on stage preaching outside the church, gunmen were, were just shooting popcorn all over the place while people were still in church. And that's the situation there. In Tabar, where I live, in Port-au-Prince, the capital, it is basically chaos. Haiti. So we're going to say, well, the whole world is like this. That's true. But when it comes home to a place where we were safe and peaceful, suddenly it turns into a war zone. It's very difficult. I've been trying to go. I've been, I'm being told not to come in. Don't even set foot in here because there is no guarantee of uh, our safety. So that's the situation there, the social political in the country, in the capital city. We don't have a government, pretty much that is functional, it's constitutional. We have a prime minister, that election should have been held weeks ago, um, months ago, but none of the, that has happened. And uh, the population is just rising and reacting and fighting. That's Haiti. Do they need God? Yes. They need preaching? Yes. Do I need to go to Haiti? Yes, I do need to go to Haiti. Will I go? Yes, I will go. Despite that, when I don't know, but I will. Because so far, God has not told me yet that uh, it is time to be removed from Haiti, to be elsewhere. He takes me away when the time is right, but the desire to go back and continue preaching the gospel in Haiti is still there. Haiti Christian Mission supports that. They're given the freedom, the liberty to judge, uh, to gauge the situation, to decide when to go. But uh, our decision is to continue working in Haiti. We have the church in Tabar. That is going on. We have a church at the mountain in almost central Haiti that also is growing. They're both growing very slowly as uh, people come and people go, but uh, the gospel is being preached. We have a major issue in Haiti and in our area, we have difficulty finding New Testament ministers. And on that topic, I think I'd like to talk to you about uh, Sunrise Bible College idea. But we cannot find ministers, doctrinally sound ministers, New Testament ministers. And uh, we have done some training 
out of seven students, we managed to, uh, to uh, keep two. They're now preaching in my state at the church in Tabar, husband and wife. They're ministering there. And uh, out of seven, we managed to salvage two. And I think the thing to do is to multiply the training. So the, the Haiti Bible Institute becomes a predominant ministry for Haiti Christian Mission in Haiti. I am not satisfied with the halfway, like as long as the person says Jesus and I move with them. You and I know very well that is not necessarily the truth. I think God's plan of salvation is, for the church, I mean, is in the New Testament. And I think the, the preaching that Paul and the apostles preached should be the standard for the church of Christ in our world. And not enough people have that level of conviction. And in Haiti, it is not very common. So I think we need to step up the work in training leaders. And Haiti Christian Mission is trying to do that. We want to do that. We can tell you that I have a very well structured because we were in Taba, had to move because things got so bad. So right now we're trying to move the Bible Institute up in the central part of Haiti where the ministry is moving right now. We are also, uh, I also believe in education. As, I, as you know very well, I've spent my life in education and I continue working, teaching in Haiti. And uh, we are starting a new school. It is in construction and uh, not in Haiti. We have pictures outside if you want to look at them. We have pictures outside that shows the construction where we are right now. The walls are up, we need a roof, and that's what I was going to go down to do next trip, but I have not been able to do that so far. But we need a roof on there. We need to do the floor, get the, church, the school opened. And the plan was to open school up this September, coming September, which is not going to take place. So we are waiting until God makes it possible for us to be able to go down and work, put the school together. We also need to do training for our teachers. Contrary to America, we don't have colleges that put our teachers, as you guys do. Uh, most of the time, we have to train our own teachers, and we have been training our own teachers. So we need to go down and do seminars for the teachers. We want to select teachers, train them, and place them in the classrooms with continued training as they teach. The Bible Institute is also important for that. We hope to be able to, once the school open, to have, uh, we have enough space, let me say, for about 500 and some students in our school where we hope to be able to give them two meals a day and a good, solid Christian education. And with that, let the school be an outreach into the families and the community, into the different uh, groups of people to uh, reach them with the gospel. It is difficult to go and tell them, we go, and they, we speak, they don't necessarily have a reason to move. But when the kids are in the school, they see in action the acts of the church and the gospel and the ministry, and I think we'll have a better response as we head in Tabar, where we are now. So I invite you, one, to take a look outside in the foyer uh, for, of the school, information is on there, and I'm open to questions. Whenever you have questions, I'd be happy to answer that. But God, God has a plan, because our God is a God of purpose. He has a plan for what is happening. The, the, the situation in Haiti happens, I think, for a reason. I don't know what exactly, why the reason, why Haiti is not changing, why things are not getting better in Haiti. But our focus should not be on the here and now predominantly. I think as Christians, we should be looking beyond the here and now, what's going on in our, in our world, the development, the lack of them, the uh, benevolence that we do in our world, because uh, our purpose was not to come into the world and make it a better place. It is not to come into the world and uh, eliminate our hunger or eliminate whatever it is that you want to eliminate or even to achieve world peace. That's not the point of our 
ministry in the church here. Our ministry is to do God's purpose. The purpose of God is to, is to bring humankind back to him. And we are the agents to do that. We are the agents to go out. As I said earlier, Christ said in uh, Mark 16, to go into all the world and make disciples, I mean, teach and preach the gospel, Matthew 28, to make disciples, teach people to understand me, to know me, to know my life, to know that I, that I love them, to know that I have a better place for them in eternity and invite them to come into the family. The family which is the church. The family that we Christians are supposed to uphold, to supposed to, 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 uh, to teach and to help people understand. Not creating our own, but helping people to understand the purpose of God. The purpose of God is in Scripture, in the New Testament for the church, understanding God from the Old Testament, how God is. And His love for us leads Him to take a step back and allow His Son to move forward. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, it is not that God doesn't see or He doesn't understand what's going on, but He uses patience, giving us time to come to repentance. And I paraphrase. So because of Christ, we have a chance to be ourselves and take time to choose God or not choose Him. I chose God at one time, and He's been great for me. I've missed out on a lot of possibilities. You know, giving my personality, my persistence, I think I could make it very well here in the States, financially. I could make it very well. I have everything it takes to make it. But what would that have afforded me in the end? What benefit, really, would I have gained at the moment when I'm about to close my eyes from this world and move on to the next you know, how much of that could I have taken with me? And from my education as a kid, I learned that it is better to serve God with your life and whatever God has given you than to uh, accumulate wealth on this earth and ignore God. And that is the teaching that I passed on to my children. That's the teaching that we, my wife and I, have tried to pass on to every kid who's gone through our school system because that is the basis for tomorrow. That's the basis for our world tomorrow. And you never know what God may use some of those kids to be leaders in Haiti and change the situation. We never know which one of them is going to come up and our job is to go with them. Paul hasted out for good or for bad. We know that he was led by the Spirit. He made the decision to go. But Paul did that because his life was wholly submitted to God. Submitted in his mind, submitted in his desires, his wants. And that's what we as Christians want to do as well with our own life. We, my wife and I, are in Haiti. You are here. You must understand that the work that God has given you to do in this community, in this area, in this city, in this state, okay, is one that has eternal value and that we, one we should take very seriously. So as I said previously, that the world today, the devil has used tons of distractions to lure us away. Remember Jesus' is. Uh, a parable of the four types of soil in Matthew chapter 13, if I'm not mistaken. He talked about the third type of soil. The third one is a very fertile soil that grows, where plants grow fast. But the seed is planted, the weed grows, growing faster than the, than the seed, than the good plant, chokes it and kills it. And the field did not produce as needed because it was covered 
by destruction, the things of the world, Christ explained, the things that uh, distract us. And today we have a lot more of those than the days when Christ was alive. So as a Christian, as people who work with Christ, determined to follow God, determined to do what God, uh, the purpose that he has for your life, as he had for Paul. He called Paul in Acts chapter 9 to go be a witness to me in front of both Jews and Gentiles, in front of kings and all those uh, great leaders. And you saw how Paul's life went through. We don't have a meeting with Christ telling you specifically, this is what I want you to do for me. We, do, we don't have that chance, but we do have the Spirit living in us, guiding us, if we are able to listen to His guidance and listen to what He does. If you can remember the calling that we have and how to use that calling for God, I think our life may have the purpose that God has for it. Because God, who is the God of purpose, does nothing without a reason. Everything, Paul says in, in Romans 8, happened for the good of those who love God and call according to his, uh, his good purpose. God calls, he makes things happen, he uses things in our lives in a way to speak to us. And he tries to get our attention. And sometimes we miss it because we focus on the situation. We miss it because we're trying to understand so badly that we not listen to what he has to say. We miss it because we feel so pitiful for ourselves because, you know, you're judging how fair, how not fair, how this or that, and we miss God's point. I'm not telling you anything new. But as fellow Christians, I think it's worth reminding each other every once, every once in a while. Why we're here, what we're called to do here. My job here as a missionary, which all of you are here, mine is in Haiti, you here, is to listen to what God wants us to do, listen to his will, try to understand it, follow his word. You're not going to have an audible call from God uh, one night as Abraham and, and Moses, everyone, all those, those people had when God comes and says, I called you to get out and you sacrifice your kid or come here or take the Israelites out, Israelites out or whatever. Take off your shoes because it's a holy place. You're not going to hear God say that. But, but I believe that God speaks to me many times. And he speaks to you. Many times, through circumstances, through the preaching on the pulpit, through your own reading, through observations that you make, through things that you are, you, you, you are around, he speaks to you. And I think if you pay attention and you listen to him, you keep quiet and you listen to him, you, you quiet your surroundings and uh, listen, you will know what purpose God has for your life and thereby make a difference in our world not allowing the louder voices to take the microphones because we are called to go out and proclaim a very positive message, a message of salvation. And you've partnered with me in doing that in Haiti, and I'm certain, I don't know what you do here, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that you have uh, ministries going on here that touch the community. But I think that's something we need to multiply and continue doing faithfully. Because the time is short. If you read Revelations and you observe what's happening today, you can see the shape up of the end times. You can see that things are shaping up in our world today. So we need to reactivate our work for God. Step on preaching the gospel. Because there are many, many out there who still need to hear the gospel. Who still need to make a decision. And they will not come unless we speak. They will not come unless we understand the need, the urgency of it. So to that, I'm inviting you. I'm thanking you for supporting Haiti Christian Mission and myself.
as I said, I invite you to ask questions. I don't have many pictures and any new pictures to show you because uh, I've been stuck here for the last, what, seven, eight months, you know, with everything that's going on. So no new pictures. But uh, work continues in Haiti as I teach online, as I preach online, and uh, I work with my construction guys online as well with videos. So uh, we continue working. Nothing has stopped except that physically I've not been in Haiti. And I'm asking you to help me pray so that I, because I need to get back to Haiti. I need to get back and give new directions so that we can move to the next level and hopefully get that school going pretty soon. It is very need, need, needed in Haiti. People can stay in the capital. They're running from it. And kids are coming back to the countryside with nowhere to go, no school to go to. And I think this school is very timely and it's very important. So your prayers and your support are most important for the success and the continuation of Haiti Christian Missions Ministry in Haiti. So please, when you step out, go to the foyer, look at some pictures, ask some questions. We'll be happy to answer the questions. And uh, uh, I don't think I said much of what you wanted to hear about Haiti, but I'm sure there are questions in your mind. I'd be happy to answer those. And I thank you for having me here one more time. As uh, Warren said, I've been coming here since 80, 1984, as I said. I feel like uh, this is almost like home to me. Kentucky is my second home for sure. But Connorsville is one of the towns that I'm so familiar with, just like I'm with Coburn. And so I'm more a person of this community than where I live right now. So thank you for welcoming me and my family and uh, supporting Haiti Christian Mission and the work that we do in Haiti. Thank you. Let us, uh, let us uh, <coughs> allow me to lead you in a word of prayer before I step down, please. A prayer for Haiti, a prayer for a, my mind and my wife's physical recuperation, but mostly a prayer for the future of our ministries and our community. Dear Father, we are grateful to you. We come to you, dear God, in urgency, urgency of uh, prayer for situations that we do not control, situations that are difficult in our communities, situations in our country, situations that we really <clears throat> deplore but cannot stop or have any kind of control over. But we know for very certain that you are in control. You were present, uh, as the word says, during the flood, and you are present here today in our social mediatic f f uh, flood as well. We know that you're here with your church. We know that you're here with your servants in this community, in this church, in Haiti Christian Mission, the churches associated with it, and our churches in Haiti. Even though we're facing difficult, different situations and difficult situations, but we know that you are present and you are guiding because uh, Jesus promised to be with his church always. And he gave us the guarantee that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And we have confidence that you are present, guiding. Give us ears to listen. Give us ears to listen. Give us the mind to understand you and the heart to be willing to go and do what you call us to do. Thank you for this congregation its friendship, its support over the years that have been so faithful. We thank you, God, for all the friends that we have here, people that we literally consider as families. We thank you for them. We thank you, God, for our joint ministry, their cooperation with the ministry in Haiti. I thank you for that. I pray, God, that you help us stay physically healthy, and I thank you for having been with me, showing your power and keeping our lives and uh, 
working with circumstances to put us in the right place at the right time. We thank you for all that you do and all that you will continue doing. Give us the vision for your church and give us the courage to face our society and, the surmount, and to surmount the difficulties so that we can continue faithfully executing the work that you have called us to do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, Schubert, thank you so much for coming out uh, today and speaking to us, and we are thankful uh, that you are healing and doing well, and uh, let's all commit to praying, uh, not only for Schubert's mission in Haiti, but that he is able to return and go back and continue the work there. So uh, at this time, if everyone would stand up, we're going to have our time of invitation and if there's anyone here today who has never made that decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, we would love to talk with you about how you can do that today. So uh, we invite you to come as we sing together. We're so thankful that you came out today to worship with us. Hope everyone has a great afternoon. Uh, board members, remember there is a meeting tonight at 5 p.m., uh, so don't forget that. And we're just about a week away from the Licking Valley Men's Fellowship Fish Fry, which will take place here at the church. And uh, we need volunteers, and uh, we need desserts and tea, so please keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for your blessings on our life, even when we don't deserve it. That's grace. And Lord, we do come to you today on behalf of our communities, on behalf of the people around us that we love, who are made in your image. God, give us the courage to speak words of life, words of truth, words of healing words of correction. God, may we uh, stand in the gap for those uh, who need to know you, and may they come to a saving relationship. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, and we'll hope to see you next time.